This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 826, recorded on November 4th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Um, all right, well, let's get going. We've got a lot to cover. Um, and let me start off with my quotation. I am convinced that men hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. And they don't know each other because they don't communicate with each other. And they don't communicate with each other because they are separated from each other. And that was MLK in a speech at Cornell. So um, as we go forward, I think that one of the themes that I think is really important is we have learned more. We need to be moving forward, and it's going to take communication. We're going to have to talk these things through. Um, as Vincent, as you bring up, you're, you're now going to go out and you're going to participate in indoor dining with a group of 10. Um, and I'm going to say that's okay. Um, you know, you look at parts of the world where they have really high immunization rates. Um, we need to start making decisions now in the context of um, immunizations, vaccination coverage, um, you know, therapeutics, testing, other things that we were not maybe comfortable, maybe we're not as wise a choice as a year ago. So, um, but as we move forward, um, for a lot of people, it's going to be tough. And I think we just have to be, we have to be talking, we have to be looking at the data, we have to be evolving towards, um, you know, decisions which are appropriate now, maybe we're not as uh, comfortable decisions a year or so ago. So, that's the theme I'm going to be going with as we move forward here. Um, children, COVID, and mental health. This is actually going to be the exciting uh, you know, update this week. So I say children are at risk for COVID. Wearing a mask is less traumatic for a child than being hospitalized. Maybe I'm going to throw in there getting vaccinated is less traumatic than either of those. So on Tuesday, uh, November 2nd, 2021, um, CDC Director Dr. Walensky endorse the CDC Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, the ACIP recommendation that children 5 to 11 years old be vaccinated against COVID-19 with the Pfizer-BioNTech pediatric vaccine, right? That's the smaller dose. CDC now expands vaccine recommendations to about 28 million children in the United States in this age group and allows providers to begin vaccinating them as soon as possible. So what you saw here is first the FDA EUA expansion, and now you're actually seeing a CDC recommendation, an encouragement um, for vaccination in this population. Um, there'll be a lot of questions, and one of the nice things that I really applaud about the way this is being rolled out is the goal here is to allow individuals who want to, families, parents with their children, to go to a pediatrician's office, to have a conversation. Um, people probably know I have a tremendous amount of, of um, admiration for pediatricians. Um, this is really a, a tough job, and this is going to be a challenge in the coming weeks, having these conversations, listening. Sometimes it takes a while to understand what are the parents concerned about? What information do they need? Um, one of our colleagues, actually, um, in the Twix universe recently had a question about their wife getting, um, getting a booster. Um, it was a 45-minute conversation. I mean, these conversations can go on for a while before um, everyone involved really feels comfortable with the, with the decision in front of them. And that is fine. Having questions about vaccines, there's no stigma there. Now, what I do want to hear, throw here is just the concept that you're making a decision either way. Um, with all the sort of um, consequences attendant there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw in a second quotation in this section, and this is from Ben Franklin. Um, when Ben Franklin's 300th birthday came around, he was not alive, as you might imagine, <laughs> um, we made a trip down to Philadelphia. Um, it was sort of a Ben Franklin 300th birthday celebration, the family, we all went down. Um, so I'm a huge fan of Ben Franklin. I mean, he just had some wonderful um, quotations. 
Um, and this quotation, I think, is really appropriate um, with the decision to give parents the opportunity to vaccinate their children down to age five. Um, and also maybe more so if people listen to TWIV 822, Viking Variola Variants. Um, and that was a great episode. I actually, I was listening to that while waiting for a train in the Moynihan train station. So this is, uh, this is a little from Ben Franklin. In 1736, I lost one of my sons a fine boy of four years old by the smallpox, taken in the common way. I long regretted bitterly and still regret that I had not given it to him by inoculation. This I mentioned for the sake of parents who omit that operation on the supposition that they should never forgive themselves if the child died under it. My example showing that the regret may be the same either way and that therefore the safer should be chosen. So... Just throw that out there for parents as we go forward. Um, you know, no one wants to have to do anything with any risk to their child, but I think the um, preponderance of evidence suggests that the safer option in this age group is going ahead with the immunization rather than risking um, getting infection. All right. The uh, testing section, never miss an opportunity to test. Um, I recently did an echo conference, um, really invited by a friend of mine who had recently won an award. Um, the Humanitarian um, Man of the Year Award, right? Um, and this was for University of Missouri. And there was a question that came up about the um, impact of symptoms on the sensitivity of rapid testing. So I'm going to talk about a paper that was just published. But before I go into this, I wanted to do a little bit of will be a refresher course on CT values and RNA copy numbers. Um, so let's let's remember what this is. One of the ways that we diagnose um, acute COVID um, is by looking for RNA from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And what we do is we do this polymerase chain reaction where we, we keep doubling the amount of RNA there. Um, and every time we double it, it's a cycle, right? So if there's a ton of RNA there, you only have to double it a few times before there's so much that you can detect it. But a lot of times, if there's just a tiny bit of genetic material there, you might have to run this machine cycle after cycle after cycle. And really what the CT value is, is how many cycles did you have to run before you finally could detect the genetic material? So the higher that CT number, the smaller amount of RNA copies were there. The PCRs we now have are incredibly sensitive. There can be less than a thousand RNA copies, um, and you can pick that up. But you pick that up maybe at a CT value of about 40. So think of a CT value of 40 being about an RNA copy number of a thousand or less. Now, a CT value of 30, you got to run it 30 cycles, that's going to pick up as little as 50 thousand RNA copies, that's going to be right about when we start getting antigen test positivity. And this is the last number. This is a CT value of 25. That's when you have greater than a million RNA copies. This is when we think people are infectious, when their CT value is less than 25, right? So one of the things we've learned over time is depending upon which question we're asking, we want to be thinking about how much RNA is there. We want to be thinking about CT values. We want to think about what is the appropriate test. So there was recently a really nice paper, Factors That Influence the Reported Sensitivity of Rapid Antigen Testing for SARS-CoV-2, published in Frontiers in Microbiology. So there's an evolving methodology to performing reviews. And the authors, I think, here did a really good job. When you start looking at all these um, studies, you don't just throw them together. There's a methodology here. So they actually, I will say, they have followed really um, proper methodology. They started with 1,695 sources identified during the database search. Uh, from that group, the potential pool of articles were, was reduced. 148 underwent full text review for data extraction, ultimately 83 articles of the 148 were chosen for this meta-analysis. So this, this is a lot of work that went into this. Um, the critical conclusion, what did, what did they find when they went through this? That while patients being symptomatic or asymptomatic may correlate with test results, it was really the level of viral RNA 
being up above or below certain thresholds correlating with contagiousness that determine the sensitivity of the rapid test. So let's look at our let's look at our numbers. They found that for CT values less than 25, so these are the RNA copy numbers of greater than a million and then a million, this correlated with infectiousness, the sensitivity of these rapid tests was greater than 96% across all of these real world studies. Now, when the CT values were <clears throat> less than 30, then the RNA copy numbers are uh, about 50,000 or so. Now we're getting below the level of contagiousness. You still had a sensitivity of greater than 90%. But when the CT values got greater than 30, when the RNA copies got less than 50,000, when they were clearly below the level of contagiousness, then the sensitivity drops considerably. Now they looked at PCR, they looked at viral culture in this review, and there are a couple points they made. The high sensitivity of the PCR cannot distinguish RNA fragments from infectious virus, rendering the PCR approach vulnerable to the generation of false positive results if one is looking for contagiousness. Um, they suggested that actually the majority of those positive PCR results indicated an individual who had been infected but was no longer contagious, no longer capable of spreading the virus. Um, and they said this was especially true because they were able to show negative cell culture results. So I think this is sort of a critical thing for us to be thinking about. Um, the antigen tests are very good at identifying, reliably identifying individuals who are contagious. They're actually reliable even in asymptomatic individuals. It's really the CT score that was predictive. Most people who don't have symptoms, who have a positive PCR, they're no longer contagious. So you're picking up a lot of, and now I'm, I see, I see Vincent's got a hand up. So this is awesome. Go for it. I'm, I'm curious about how they concluded that someone was contagious. Did they say if we could recover infectious virus from a nasal wash, then they're likely to be contagious or did they do something more than that? Because I think that's not enough, right? Cause we don't yeah. know how much virus. So this CT of you know, greater than a million where you say we now have infectivity, but where do we actually transmit at? <laughs> yeah, no. So I think this is excellent. And this is great because I think this is an important area to spend some time on. Um, so this has sort of grown over, well, almost two years of data, right? It's sort of been evolving mm -hmm. over time. So some of the things we've learned, um, initially, we really focused in on timing, right? We knew that the period where case control studies were picking up um, transmission was in general about two days before the onset of symptoms, right? It's based on symptomatic people. Um, and really not much after 10 days, really not much after five days after this. So we saw this clustering um, and we started seeing a correspondence here with levels of the viral RNA. Um, so a lot of this is built on that concept. If you look at people two days before, if you look at people in the five to seven days afterwards, maybe out to 10, this is when you have these levels above this level of about a million correlated with contact tracing hits. Now, what they did in the study mm -hmm. really was they, they built on that, but they didn't actually have any contact tracing here. This is based upon that correlation, right? So second level. So you've got contact tracing, getting the connection with the viral RNA levels. Here you have them looking at the viral RNA levels and the sensitivity of the testing. Um, and they did have some viral culture data in this. But again, right, the, the, I, I feel like we're back to weapons of mass destruction, right? The inability to culture a virus is not you know, evidence that the virus you know, couldn't be transmitted. Uh, but it's part of, I think, part of that picture. I think it's a really hard conclusion to make mm -hmm. right and the kinds of studies you need to do are really hard and so i would caution people about making conclusions of copy number and uh, transmission and the other confounding factor daniel as you know 80 percent of transmission is done by just 20 percent of people and those appear to have the highest copy number yeah, you know, the, the highest yeah. that we see for some reason they're special and they transmit really well. And who knows what that copy number is? I don't know if you remember the study out of University of Colorado Boulder. I was gonna, yeah, I was, right? <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna. I think that's a fantastic, yeah. Where they had a 
10, 20 percent of all the students were had the highest copy number through the ceiling, right? And they said this yeah. is consistent with that fraction doing most of the transmission. So yeah, no, I that- think that's a great no, that's a great study. So that was where what was it ninety percent of the genetic material was in ten percent of the students, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, I remember when they were setting that trial up and that was first coming out. So I, I think that's important too to realize it's it's only about ten to twenty percent of individuals yeah. who get infected that actually do any spreading. I mean, eighty yeah. percent of people never spread it to anyone else. No. Um, I think the the nice thing about this data, and this is to sort of build on what's on the horizon we talked about last time, is the CDC is considering maybe this test to stay at school paradigm. You know, if someone has a ton of viral RNA, they're going to test par- positive on a rapid test. If you have a mm-hmm. negative rapid test and they have, a you know, 50,000, 100,000 bits of RNA, that person ends up going to school they're not going to spread it. The likelihood of them spreading is very low. So even when you look at that 90%, 96% sensitivity, it's close to 100% for those spreaders, those people with all that high level. So, And because it's so hard to spread in general, right? Vaccinated people are far less likely to do that because there you have, you're further reducing the amount of infectious virus. So I think when you see outbreaks, it's, those unvaccinated people, and it's 10, 20% of them that are just making a lot of virus. Yeah. I mean, the vaccination is going to reduce your risk of getting infected for some period of time. We'll see how long that lasts. Um, it also is going to reduce, as we've seen now in multiple studies, the period of time when you're probably. So so this two days before, mm-hmm. 10 after, for a vaccinated person, is probably even a smaller window. So maybe we can get our rapids to get those people back involved in society a little bit sooner without you know forcing them to have the same isolation for the infected period of an unvaccinated. Um, And it's tough too, because if we see somebody and we have a low suspicion, and let's say we send off that PCR just to be safe, and then it comes back positive two days later, um, you know, should we really cry foul? Did we really send someone out there who's infectious? Probably not. But until the Department of Health, until the public health guidance catches up, um, mm-hmm. you know, that sending off that PCR is sort of putting you in this vulnerable situation where you're going to, you know, have buyer's remorse using those rapid tests. So. Can you take, can you make decisions on whether you can do things again based on a rapid antigen test? So, so we certainly can. Let's say someone comes into the office and it makes sense and you have a high pretest, clinical pretest probability and the rapid is positive. That might be someone we go right ahead and do monoclonals or, or other mm-hmm. things. Um, it's probably going to be the context in which we start oral antivirals when those are available because you don't want to wait for the testing right. resulting delay. Um, and the other side, though, is what if you're, you know, what if you're not sure, you know, that PCR test comes positive, you might be picking up, you know, an asymptomatic infection that happened four weeks earlier. So mm-hmm. th- this is not, yeah, this is not going to be easy. And I think this will be one of those great situations for the at-home do-it-yourself rapid tests, um, you know, because you, you put this, you know, on a pediatrician or a primary care or an urgent care doctor, you know, to make the diagnosis, which a PCR may or may not do, it might over-diagnose it. Um, but yeah, public health decisions, not wanting to send people out while they're infectious, that may be the way other countries are doing this where they give better access to those rapid tests. What are they? $6 a test in France. Well, in um, Germany, they're free. Yeah. <laughs> you can go every day and get one for free. And that's what we need yeah. to be doing. Yeah. Um, it is but, It is a lot cheaper than some of the other um, uh, things we have spent our money on as a nation. Wasn't Biden going to give away rapid antigen tests to Americans? Um, yes. <laughs> I believe that will <laughs> eventually happen. Okay. <laughs> All right. Active vaccination. Never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. Vaccination is how this pandemic ends. Vaccine, the jabs that keep you from getting sick. Um, so this this is, I actually have this tagged in red, most important one this week. Um, and so this article is laboratory confirmed COVID-19 among adults hospitalized with COVID-19 like illness with infection induced or mRNA vaccine induced SARS-CoV-2 immunity. Nine states, January, September 2021, published in the MMWR early release. So I like the wording here, right? And I think uh, Shane Crotty was someone who made the point of, why are we calling one natural immunity and the other vaccine-induced? They're both natural immunity. It's just one is infection-induced and one is vaccine-induced. So I will, I'm stealing that from you, Shane. Um, so here, 
the CDC is looking at this, this issue that people are really asking, I had COVID before. Is that as good as a vaccine? Um, should I go get a vaccine? Are people who are vaccinated, are they less likely not to end up with a positive test? I care less about that. But are they less or more likely to end up in hospital for an acute COVID-19 infection? So here the CDC is using data from the Vision Network to examine hospitalization in adults with COVID-19-like illness. So this is hospitalizations due to COVID um, and comparing the odds of receiving a pos positive SARS-CoV-2 test result and thus having laboratory confirmed COVID-19 between the unvaccinated patients with a previous SARS-CoV-2 infection um, or patients who are fully vaccinated with an mRNA COVID-19 vaccination um, without previous documented SARS-CoV-2 infection. So what, what is the Vision Network, right? This is a huge network. Um, this is funded by the CDC. The Vision Network includes Columbia University, Irving Medical Center, New York, prestigious university. Um, it includes health partners out at Minnesota and Wisconsin, um, Intermountain Healthcare, that's out in Utah, Kaiser Permanente, Northern California, Kaiser Permanente Northwest, Oregon and Washington, the Reigenstrief Institute in Indiana, and the University of Colorado. I feel like I've got a connection to every one of these institutions. So this is, this is very nice. Um, and I think this is really important to note that here we're not just looking at a positive test. We're looking at people who are hospitalized with COVID-19. So during January 1 through September 2nd, 2021, a total of 201,269 hospitalizations for COVID-19-like illness were identified. Uh, molecular testing for SARS-CoV-2 was performed for 94,264 patients. Among these patients, 7,348 met criteria for either of the two exposure categories, right? So we can include them here. And what did they find? find. So they found that the adjusted odds ratio of laboratory confirmed COVID-19 was significantly higher in the unvaccinated individuals with an adjusted odd ratio of 5.49. So overall unvaccinated individuals compared to vaccinated individuals, those relying on infection induced immunity were over five times as likely to end up in the hospital with COVID-19. Now, again, there's a comparison. Pfizer-BioNTech, it was 5.1. Moderna was 7.3. But now if you looked at the highest risk individuals, so patients aged greater than or equal to 65, the adjusted odds ratio was 19.57. So I think that this is this is an important um, this is an important study, um, and it's consistent with the CDC uh, message that all eligible persons should be vaccinated against COVID nineteen as soon as possible, including unvaccinated persons previously infected with SARS CoV two. And I think this builds on the MMW article we've talked about before, reduced risk of reinfection with SARS CoV two after COVID nineteen vaccination, where they were showing that if people were infected before and got two doses, not just one dose, this isn't Harry Met Sally, this is get those two doses, there's a statistically significant reduction in people going on to end up infected. Here, a really significant reduction in people ending up hospitalized um, for COVID-19. All right, Vincent, any comments? I, I thought this was really a great article. but I like it very much. I think it's, uh, we're finally getting to see some really well done studies that make a lot of sense, right? Yeah. As compared to earlier on when we didn't have a lot of data, it was too soon and so forth. So yeah. um, I, 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 I agree. And it's nice to see a peer reviewed publication looking at, you know, severe, moderate to severe disease, yeah. hospitalized with COVID-19, um, a lot better than people, you know, sort of throwing out, you know, preprints without peer review that support their you know side of the we need data we need science to know what really uh, matters so um, i will say on halloween the idsa issued a statement the infectious diseases society of america the idsa strongly supports the cdc's recommendation that unvaccinated people previously infected with the virus that causes covid19 get vaccinated as soon as possible 
after they have fully recovered. And they go on to say, new data demonstrate a higher, more robust, and more consistent level of immunity with vaccination than with COVID-19 infection alone. Vaccination after COVID-19 infection significantly improves protection from reinfection and hospitalization. And so that was from Daniel P. McQuillan. He's the president of ID Society of America. All right. So one of the things that comes up, of course, though, we're all excited about getting vaccinated, but what if I have allergy symptoms? Is, is this going to be safe? So um, in, in our vaccine Q&A, this, this came up and I, I mentioned this article, but now I'm actually going to share it more formally. So this was the article, Association of Self-Reported High-Risk Allergy History with Allergy Symptoms After COVID-19 Vaccination, published in JAMA Network Open. So this was a rather, again, rather robust study. A total of 52,998 healthcare employees were included in the cohort, um, of whom 97.6% received two doses of an mRNA vaccine, um, 0.9%, so 474, reported a history of high-risk allergies. So a a history of high-risk allergy was associated with an increased risk of allergic reactions, right? So they did see that. Um, They saw issues with hives. They saw issues with angioedema. But what they did find was that though these high-risk allergy histories were associated with having an issue, with having a reaction, um, they were able to complete the two-dose vaccine protocol among this cohort of eligible healthcare employees. So even though you have those concerns, you still can potentially be vaccinated. Um, You may be an individual who wants to have a discussion with your physician, with someone who is um, knowledgeable Um, allergy, immunology, knowledgeable with COVID-19 vaccines, Um, but that's not an exclusion criteria. We can get all these folks protected. All right. Um, This is another study I liked, not as much as the first one. So, you know, like my having favorites among my children, but community transmission and viral load kinetics of the SARS-CoV-2 Delta variant in vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals in the UK, a prospective longitudinal cohort study. This was published in the Lancet Infectious Disease. Now, I always want to change viral load with viral RNA copy numbers, but all right, we'll we'll see if we can do that here. Um, I think this article is being misquoted a bit, um, so but I think there's some good information in here. So let's let's sort of hit on uh, what we can pull out of here, which uh, I think is accurate, which I think is helpful. So we know that vaccinated people are less likely to get infected um, with co- with SARS-CoV-2, less likely to get COVID-19. So we have that. Uh, We see that again here. Um, In this article, there's also more information on how vaccinated people um, clear the, I'm going to say, the viral RNA more quickly. Um, So let's focus on a couple of the high points. So the authors compared viral load trajectories, I'm going to say viral RNA levels, from fully vaccinated individuals with Delta infection with unvaccinated individuals with Delta, with alpha, um, and then the pre-alpha infections. And the primary outcome for the kinetics analysis um, were to detect differences in the the peak load, in the growth rates, in the decline between the participants. Um, And so I I keep replacing here in my mind RNA copy number. But they found that although the peak RNA copy number did not differ by vaccination status or variant type, fully vaccinated individuals had a faster mean rate of RNA copy number decline. Um, So this was a household contact study. So there was a significant amount of exposure. So despite the Singapore study and this one showing that you have a faster drop in that RNA copy number, um, if you're spending you know, days um, in a household with an individual who is infected, infectious, um, they were actually seeing the only significant protection that the household members achieved was with vaccination, where it was 38% unvaccinated versus 25% vaccinated. Daniel, the, uh, I mean, it could be that these RNA copy level measurements represent defective, non-infectious pieces of RNA. Maybe they're abortive infections, right? Are, are you are you going to suggest that when a virus copies its genetic material, that maybe only one in a tiny fraction of those copies is, is a viable infectious virion? Sure. 
It's nothing, <laughs> it's nothing revelation. It's, it's not a revelation. It's not a yeah. No, I think for I think for non virologists, our listeners, that might be right. Like, um, what what is the uh, the successful you know infectious virion you know rate for coronavirus? I've heard range maybe one in five hundred things in that range. Is that reasonable? Uh, Could be higher, even one in thousand or higher. I don't I don't know offhand the number, but many viruses are uh, even up to one in ten thousand particles are only infectious. So. I think a vaccine can have an impact on that, and I think uh, you need to be careful to interpret these as being, as you said the other day, you know, in the non-human primate study that uh, we discussed on TWIV, the, you vaccinated non-human primates, when challenged, they have RNA by PCR, but they don't even make antibodies to N because, the, as you say, the infection's abortive, right? <laughs> Yeah, that that's an interesting thing that, you know, when I was listening to that episode, I think I uh, tweet, I think I, I messaged something. Is that texting? I message what's uh, <laughs> stay savvy with the current term. Um, <laughs> but I have seen that a few times where a vaccinated individual might have a positive um, PCR test, might have a mildly symptomatic URI mm-hmm. type. It, it seems like they're having a, a mild um, COVID-19 infection post-vaccination, um, but they never make nucleocapsid antibodies. Mm-hmm. So I, I would I would sort of agree. I mean, I'd love to see studies on that. Um, but this goes along with one of the things, you know, a lot of us are afraid, right, that oh, these mild infections, even though they don't end up hospitalized or, um, or dying, that we're going to continue to see long COVID. But I was actually speaking to the nurse practitioner who works in our post-COVID recovery clinic. We're not seeing a lot of people develop long COVID after vaccination. Um, so I think that's encouraging. I think that, um, you know, not only will we see all these things, but I actually think the vaccinations are going to have a really profound impact on preventing, you know, PASC long COVID mm-hmm. syndromes. That would be great. Yeah. All right. So passive vaccination, remember monoclonals after high risk exposures. We'll get more into those in a second. Um, But, you know, a person has an exposure. um, You want to be thinking about your high risk people getting that. And for individuals that have gone ongoing exposure, it's not pre-exposure, but there is a post-exposure continued um, therapeutic if they're going to continue to have those high risk exposures and be a person who's not going to mount that protection. All right. The period of detectable viral replication, the viral symptom phase, the time for monitoring and monoclonals, not the time for antibiotics, not the time for steroids, um, and the comet ICE data on monoclonals. This is now um, published as a peer-reviewed article in the New England Journal of Medicine, and this is early treatment of COVID-19 with SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibody Sotrovimab. And so we discussed this data back when it was just a press release, um, but this is now peer reviewed. So in this ongoing multi-center double blind phase three trial, non-hospitalized patients with symptomatic COVID-19 less than or equal to five days after the onset of symptoms and at least one risk factor for disease progression were randomly assigned in a one-to-one ratio to receive a single infusion of Sotravimab at a dose of 500 milligrams or placebo. The primary outcome was hospitalization for greater than 24 hours for any cause or death within 29 days after randomization. Um, So what did we find? Um, Basically, there was a relative risk reduction of 85% for progressing to hospitalization or death. Um, Even a little bit of subtleties, um, in the placebo group of the 21 patients admitted, Five were admitted to the intensive care unit, including one who died by day 29. No safety concerns were reported with the treatment. So um, again, and this is because I think people are already asking me these questions. If you're within the first five days, um, what what at this point, what does the evidence suggest is more effective? Uh, Getting potentially Thor's hammer, the oral uh, antiviral, or the monoclonal antibodies. The monoclonal antibodies can continue to be really strong as far as the data. Vincent, any comment on Thor's hammer versus monoclonals? Can you get both? That's, uh, you know, that's like, you know, that's secret option C. Like I remember there was the old joke where you're going to pick up your girlfriend at the airport and the choice, you know, and, and the, she asks you whether or not you're going to come all the way to the, to the gate or meet her at uh, mm-hmm. the curb or meet her at baggage claim. Right. And if she didn't mention coming all the way to the gate, that was secret option C. Um, nowadays, I don't think you're allowed to choose secret option C. We'll see if you're going to be allowed mm-hmm. to choose secret option C here. Can you have both? 
All right, the early inflammatory phase, right? This is when people often get hospitalized. So here's with those oxygen saturations are less than 94%. We see benefit with steroids. Remdesivir is often started. Um, we talked a little bit about using the IL-6 receptor antagonist TOSI. Um, so it took me a little while to get through this paper. It's a very long paper, but it was a meta-analysis, beneficial and harmful outcomes of tocilizumab in severe COVID-19, a systematic review and meta-analysis published in the Journal of Pharmacology. Um, this 64 studies were ultimately included, 54 were controlled observational trials with 50 retrospective, 4 prospective, 10 randomized controlled trials. Um, these overall results provided data from 20,616 hospitalized patients, um, 7,668 received TOSI in addition to standard of care, 12,948 only receiving um, standard of care. So what did they find? So the hospital-wide pooled mortality odds ratio, this including everyone, including those in the ICU, um, those treated with tocilizumab, um, 0.73. So about a 27% um, mortality reduction. Um, now, what about some subtleties here? If you look at those patients treated with tocilizumab with a background of corticosteroids, this was 0.67, so a 33% mortality reduction. So that's the importance of the background of steroids. What about timing? They looked at the pooled in-hospital mortality. When it was given in the first 10 days, there was a 29% reduction. But if it was given after 10 days, then there was only a 17% reduction. So adding TOSI to a background of steroids in that high-risk patient who's progressing, um, timing matters, the background of steroids matters. There was a nice ASTM and H journal article, antibiotic overuse for COVID-19. Are we adding insult to injury? And the answer here was yes. This was looking in Ethiopia. They found that over 70% of COVID-19 patients received antibiotics um, either before or during admission. Um, and then they went on basically to show that it was really a minority who had any um, indication for this. So this is not just a challenge here in the U.S. It's a challenge throughout the world. Um, so uh, just keep bringing this up. A certain tiny, small, <laughs> however you want to look at this, subset may benefit, may have a secondary infection. We're usually seeing that later in the course. Okay. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna move forward to the tail phase, long COVID. And actually, here what I'm gonna be talking about is the post discharge, right? So your individual um, is in that subset of patients that do not just have an outpatient course; they end up in the hospital. And what do we do at time of discharge with regard to anticoagulation? So um, an update on anticoagulation, the American Society of Hematology Living Guidelines on the Use of Anticoagulation for Thromboprophylaxis in Patients with COVID-19, July 2021 update on post-discharge thromboprophylaxis was just put online ahead of print in blood advances. So results, the panel agreed on one additional recommendation. The panel issued a conditional recommendation against the use of outpatient anticoagulant prophylaxis in patients with COVID-19 being discharged from the hospital who do not have suspected or confirmed VTE or another indication for anticoagulation. Um, but I do want to point out their conclusion. This recommendation was based on very low certainty in the evidence, underscoring the need for high quality randomized control trials. Um, so I think this is one of those where, and I, and I like the fact that it's always qualified. This is a guideline. This is a starting point, but you really want a clinician weighing in and individualizing this recommendation. There are certain patients who are at higher risk who might benefit from anticoagulation, um, but there's a large number of people where the risk would out the benefit. And then I want to finish with no one is safe until everyone is safe. And we are now throughout the months of November, December, and January, we are fundraising for Microbe TV. So drop what you're doing right now, unless you're driving, pull the side of the road, go to parasiteswithoutborders.com, click that donate button, because we are going to try to raise $40,000 to support Microbe TV and all the great work they're doing there in the incubator. All right. Sounds good, Daniel. <laughs> okay. Now it's time for some questions. 
for Daniel from you, the listener. You can send yours to Daniel at microbe.tv. Martha writes, my parents are 85 and 92 years old. Both are healthy. Each received two Moderna doses, the second in April. They don't have health issues that would compromise their immune system. Given their ages for their third shots, would you recommend they have the full dose Moderna or the half dose booster now? Yeah, so I am still getting lots of booster questions, um, and may, maybe I'll share my own personal booster experience today, right? So um, I, I, I get these emails every single day, you know, you, are you going to sign up? Are you going to sign up? And, you know, finally, I was like, I figured that I will get a booster just to stop getting these reminder emails. And so I had gotten two doses of Moderna. Um, I'm in my 50s. I'm not really sure that, um, you know, I, I need a booster, but I, I don't need to keep getting these emails every day. So I went through the thing and really, you know, the CDC is saying, whatever you started with, go with it unless there's some, you know, reason to do something else. So I showed up and I said, I got a couple of Modernas. Can I get a J&J? &J? And they said, no. <laughs> so I said, all right, I'll just do Moderna. So I think a lot of people were overthinking this. You know, we don't have, you know, overwhelming, compelling evidence that there's a bad choice here. Um, we also don't have compelling evidence that there's, you know, but anyway, so I think it's absolutely fine. The, the current recommendation, right? If you've had two doses of Moderna, the approved Moderna booster is 50. So that is fine. That's what we recommend. If you've had a couple doses of Pfizer, you tolerated them well, go ahead and get that third dose. Um, you know, as I always say, you know, and I, I love my daughter Eloise because she really cares about her grades. You know, you've already got an A. Are we trying to get an A plus? Are we trying to squeak out a little bit? We don't know, you know, as far as it goes here. So you don't overthink it. Go ahead, get your booster. Um, you know, if you tolerate things, great. If you had some issues with those first two, that's when I think it makes sense to talk to someone about maybe switching platforms. If you had a really strong reaction to that second dose of, let's say, Moderna, um, start asking, do I really need to take the risk of getting the third? Where's the risk benefit? Should I be thinking about switching platforms? So. I am 68 years old and I have no plans to get a booster. <laughs> uh, Are you getting I... harassing emails every day, Vincent? <laughs> no, I, I'm not. Uh, so nobody cares okay. about me. My wife, on the other <laughs> hand, uh, has scheduled hers and ignoring my, <laughs> my, uh, complaints to not get one as she's no i'm getting it i don't believe anything you say <laughs> so yeah, you know my my parents right i think i shared that story and of course what i got the call like the night after my parents got their boosters daniel speak to your father he's having chills and fever yeah, there you go <laughs> so. all right melanie writes it's rainy eight degrees celsius in ottawa for those of us who receive delayed dosing is there any information on whether we are necessarily going to need a third shot we are all being told a third shot is inevitable, but most of that is based on short, roughly three-week protocols between doses one and two. I'm wondering if the signals are different for those who receive delayed dosing. Who doesn't want to avoid an extra shot in the arm, especially when those shots are so desperately needed elsewhere in the world? Yeah, no, these are all good comments. And we, we, we certainly don't know. And even, you know, as we're saying, the, the data is coming in on, you know, the impact of third dosing. Um, you know, so the immunology theory would suggest that maybe for about three months, we're going to get some sort of a decrease in, in infection, in the PCR positivity. We don't yet have, you know, the compelling de data on hospitalizations, on deaths, on the, the severe disease. Um, you know, when you have data points where they've been looking at a seven day um, observation, I'm not sure how much of that um, really can drive. So we're waiting for the science. When we have the science, when there's good science here, I'm certainly going to share that. Hugh writes, as a result of an auto accident, I had my spleen removed when I was 36 years old. I'm now a healthy 83-year-old. To what extent am I immune compromised? And will I have a normal response to SARS-CoV-2 vaccine? That's a great question. Um, now, we normally think of people who've lost their spleen at being of an increased risk of certain encapsulated bacteria, right? So... Um, but, but what about viruses? Well, there is data that people who do not have a spleen um, have worse outcomes. They're at higher risk um, with SARS-CoV-2, with a COVID-19. Um, so yeah, you, you are at increased risk of a, of a worse outcome. So um, what was the question? Was there a question there? Um, <laughs> yeah. If, uh, well, he doesn't have a spleen. Will he have a normal response to yeah. the vaccine? So that's the second question. So one, I'm going to say you are at increased risk. 
Um, why do I think you're at increased risk? Um, you know, this is sort of immunology, which a little esoteric, but I actually think it's pretty interesting. There is a neuroimmunological synapse that actually mm. occurs in the spleen involving the vagus nerve, um, and there's acetylcholine, and there probably are certain specialized immune cells that are involved in this. So that may, that's sort of the hand-waving ideas we have about why people might have worse outcomes, because with COVID-19, it's not the virus, it's that second week, it's that uncontrolled um, in early inflammatory phase, which maybe is not being down-modulated by the splenic uh, control. But if you get a vaccine, um, are you going to get as robust a response as someone without a spleen who, or with a spleen who's age match? Um, probably not, but I still would encourage you to go ahead and get vaccinated. There recently was a nice um, article where they were comparing. You know, We've always said, oh, people who are immunocompromised are not getting as good a response to the vaccines. Instead of a 90% reduction in hospitalization um, and death, it was a 77%. That's actually pretty darn good. Um, you know, I remember when 50% was our was our bar. So I still think you're going to get um, really impressive protection, maybe not as good as that person with a spleen. Uh, Laura writes, uh, I'm just a lowly layperson, but being able to hear thoughtful discussion of the latest COVID research has been immensely helpful. I feel it gives me the ability to see through the media spin and see the nuance in the research rather than oversimplified talking points. My question is about unvaccinated family members. My wife's sister and brother-in-law would like to visit. They have been honest about the fact that they are not vaccinated, nor do they plan on getting vaccinated. My wife and I are both fully vaccinated, including our booster doses. We are very conflicted about how to address their desire to visit. Is having unvaccinated guests in a fully vaccinated home a terrible idea? Other than all of us wearing N95 masks at all times and keeping the windows open, the fans on, are there any other ways to keep risk lowered? And last, are we overreacting to all of this simply because we have been so sensitive to every bit of COVID risk over the past year and a half? Yeah, no, you know, you brought up a lot of the safety steps that you can do. So, you know, being outside, increasing airflow, wearing masks. Um, one thing you didn't mention that I'll introduce into that is testing, right? If these individuals are going to come, getting them to test every morning, right? It's about $10 a day per person here in the U.S. if you buy those at-home kits. Um, but this is tough. And I think this goes back to what we started to talk about early on is that COVID is here to stay. We've got to start to figure out how, to, how do we deal with this. If we have um, you know, a family member, if we have a close friend who is not on board with getting vaccinated, um, are we going to end that relationship? Are we not going to spend time with them? <laughs> are we going to come up with solutions that we're willing to live with? Um, a lot of these are personal choices, right? Surrounding yourself with vaccinated people makes you safer. Um, people who are getting tested on a regular basis, that keeps you safer. Um, one of the things we, we've always talked about before was, you know, what used to happen with influenza and how did we comport ourselves with that risk? We used to lose, you know, 100 people a day to influenza. 90% of those were unvaccinated, but still 10% of those were vaccinated individuals who for some reason had this risk. So um, yeah, as we go forward, there is going to be a portion of our population, a portion of our family, a portion of our friends, colleagues, who decide not to get vaccinated. And we're going to have to be making decisions about what level of risk are are we comfortable taking? We think that the oral antivirals are just here on the horizon. We're moving forward with things. The risks are going to get better. So the other option is just delaying that, that risk. I know Laura doesn't care what I think, but I wouldn't have them <laughs> over if they're not vaccinated, just on principle, if anything. Yeah, um, Vincent, you probably know that would be my stance. Did you hear what Noam Chomsky said the other day? He said unvaccinated people should withdraw from society. Wow. <laughs> That's <Okay>. pretty harsh. <laughs> All right. One more from Justin. Our five-year-old daughter is quite small on the low end of percentile for weight. Is there anything to be aware of with the vax that I assume is dosed for a higher percentile population? Yeah. I, you know, this is, this comes up a lot, right? And, and I see it at both ends. You know, my, my child is five, but they're small. My child is 11, but they're big for their age. Um, and, and I've sort of been using the analogy of, you know, of cognitive development, similar to immunological development. So, you know, you wouldn't say my child is small. I'm not sure they're ready for, you know, what age appropriate grade. Their cognitive development, their immunological development, that's a lot of what we're thinking about here. This is not like certain medications or antibiotics where it's weight-based dosing. It's really the dosing ideally is based upon this concept of immunological maturity. So 
I think that using the smaller dose, the 10 micrograms, even in a five-year-old, that's the studies were five to 11. We keep moving this down. Um, I don't think size is going to be an issue. That's COVID-19 clinical update number 87 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone be safe.